Hello there. Uh, Welcome to Terrell Museum Speaker Series Thursday, um, sponsored by the Terrell Museum Cooperating Society. Um, today's speaker is Dr. Annika van Heteren. Um, Annika was born in the Netherlands, uh, studying uh, at the Universiteit Utrecht, as well as Naturalis Biodiversity Center in Leiden. She received her doctorate uh, from the University of Roehampton uh, in London, uh, worked at the Museum uh, d'Histoire Naturelle in Paris, was a Humboldt Fellow at the Rheinische Friedrich Wilhelms Universität in Bonn, and has done research at the University of New England in, in Armidale, Australia, before landing in Munich. There she is the head of uh, the mammalogy section of the Bavarian State Collection of Zoology. Her scientific work focuses on extreme adaptation uh, in vertebrates. In particular, she's interested in functional morphology, evolution, and biography of Pleistocene island animals and carnivores. Uh, for example, as in today, cave bears. She uses traditional and geometric morphometrics as well as computer modeling. Um, and with that, I will hand over to Annika to tell us about the cave bears were they really the unexpected vegetarians of the Ice Age? Thank you very much for the introduction, Jeff. Um, let me just share my screen. That should be fine like that, right? Okay. Um, so today I'll be talking a little bit about my research on cave bears, which I started during my PhD in London and I've kind of um, continued looking at cave bears um, every now and again since then. Um, we know quite a lot about cave bears. Um, we know a lot because we find their bones in caves very often, but there are also cave drawings that give us a rough idea about what these animals might have looked like. And here we see a, a reconstruction. So, but before we go to the cave bears, let's have a look at extant bears and their distributions. They are spread all across um, the Northern Hemisphere and a little bit in the South here in South America where we have the spectacled bear. The brown bear is very ubiquitous. It's pretty much everywhere. Whereas other bears such as the Malayan sun bear are only found in smaller regions. Um, and um, let's have a look at the bear family tree as well to kind of see how all these bears relate to each other. So we see here that the um, uh, cave bear, the brown bear and the polar bear, they shared an ancestor around 1.2 to 1.6 million years ago, but many other ancestors have gone before that. And I'll talk a little bit about those in just a second. What we also see is that the panda bear split off from the family tree the earliest. Second to split off is the spectacled bear. And then we have kind of a mess here in the middle uh, where different phylogenies show different relationships between the different bear species, uh, but they are all very closely related to each other. So the earliest bear ancestor over here around 20 million years ago um is the dawn bear and the dawn bear lived in the miocene in what was at that time a subtropical europe it was about the size of a fox terrier and it retained many uh, many dog-like characteristics and it did a lot of its hunting inside trees and it fed on both vegetation but also insects and small mammals then the next ancestor we can have a look at is Ursus minimus over here um, around 5.3 until 1.8 million years ago. And it is basically the, the, the basis of the Ursus line. So all bears that, that um, are closely related to the cave bear and have a genus name starting with Ursus, uh, they all have Ursus minimum, minimum as the ancestor. Um, Numerous of these bears have been found in Spain and France and Italy, so mostly in Southern Europe, um, but it's also believed to have lived in Northern Africa 
It was quite a small bear, only around 100 pounds or around 45 kilos. And it was about the same size as a modern Malayan sun bear. Um, but anatomically, it was more similar to today's Asiatic black bears. Um, now their molars and premolars were kind of different in that from their ancestors. Uh, they weren't um, adapted to sharing meat the way cats and dogs are, but more developed into a, a crushing kind of dentition for vegetation. Um, then the next ancestor is the Etruscan bear. It lived from about 5.3 million years ago until about 11,000 years ago. And then it became extinct near the end of the last glacial period. Um, it is the ancestor of the cave bear, Ursus phileus, but also Ursus de Ningeri, that we'll talk about a little bit later, Ursus safini, and Ursus arctos, the brown bear. Its remains have been found in Europe and Asia and North Africa, so it was quite ubiquitous, just like the modern brown bear. It was still about similar in size and anatomy to the Asiatic black bear, but um, over time it became larger and towards its end, it was closer to the European brown bear. Then Ursus Deningeri or Deninger's bear, that is the immediate ancestor of the cave bear. It lived from about 1.8 until uh, 1.8 million years ago until about um, 100,000 years ago. And after that, it slowly evolved into the cave bear. So they are chrono species. It is one lineage um, without any splitting. It's one lineage kind of evolving over time. With the uh, Deniger's bear, you see that the mandible is quite slender, uh, just like that of living brown bears and of its ancestor, the Etruscan bear. But it also has more derived characters, just like the cave bear, that we'll talk about a little bit later on. The closest living relative of the cave bear is the modern brown bear. Uh, we see an ice age reconstruction of the brown bear on the left and we see the modern grizzly bear on the right. Um, grizzlies are of course very large, but brown bears from Europe and from other areas can be a lot smaller and much more similar to the way brown bears were in the ice age of Europe. So what did the cave bear then look like? Well, um, it was the largest animal that inhabited the mountains during the ice ages. Of course, there were larger animals such as mammoths, but they were not living in the mountains. And it's about the same size as a modern polar bear. So um, about three and a half meters tall when standing up. And the average weight for males was between 350 to 600 kilos and females only about 200 to 250 kilos. So there was a lot of sexual dimorphism. What we see when we look at the cave bear skull is that there is a uh, very accentuated frontonasal depression here. And that is called the frontal stop or um, a stepped forehead. And this is something that other bears do not have and it makes it very easy to recognize the cave bear from a brown bear or from any other bear. Even when we're looking at um, cave drawings, for example, we can recognize the cave bear by, by this feature. Um, they also had a very tilted back. That's because the forelimbs were relatively long, but the tibias, so the lower legs were relatively short. So you see this sloping back here in this reconstruction, um, together with two cubs that are kind of playing with their mom. So when did the cave bear live exactly? Um, it lived during the ice ages. And here we see the Pleistocene, the complete Pleistocene from about 800,000 years ago um, until present. So the last bit is the Holocene, actually. This last yellow bit is where we live now. Um, and this is the amount of CO2 that is stored in the bubbles um, in glacial ice in Antarctica. And it's a proxy for temperature. So 
in these yellow phases, that's where temperatures were relatively high. So that's what we're in right now as well. Whereas in the blue stages, those were the ice ages and the temperatures were a lot lower than they are now. Um, and we see that reflected um, here with the estimated temperature during the last, um, the last ice age of the Pleistocene. So from around 20,000 years ago until around 11,000 um, years ago, we see that in the Pleistocene, the temperatures were a lot lower than they are right now in the Holocene. So we are here. Um, and this is according also to the Greenland ice cores um, where they've measured the same CO2 and then translated that to temperature. So during the Pleistocene, because the temperatures were so much colder, there was um, a lot more ice and that meant that sea levels were a lot lower. So if you'll have a look at Europe, uh, you won't be able to recognize uh, Great Britain uh, or a lot of the other islands. It's all just one big land mass. And the same is true for Scandinavia, um, simply because the sea levels were so much lower. And the entire environment was quite different. So here we see a, a reconstruction of the Pleistocene in South America, where we see a Megantherium, here and to glyptodonts, animals that are both extinct now. Um, so the cave bears, they lived in Europe. And here we see a map with all the cave bear localities, uh, pretty much all of them that we know of. So they didn't live quite here in the north, but that's because there were ice caps there, so they couldn't live there. And for whatever reason, they've never quite managed um, to get to Spain, although I think there's a few localities found now since this map was made. Um, they are usually found in caves, oops, um, where they died during hibernation. And um, even if one animal only dies occasionally, because we're talking about hundreds of thousands of years, it really adds up and we find very many of their bones um, all throughout these caves in Europe. You might notice that in the Netherlands where I'm from, we don't have any, that's because we don't have any mountains and we don't have any caves. So we don't have any cave bears. In general, they seem to have favored wooded areas uh, where food resources were abundant, although sometimes they were higher up in the mountains, but we think that they were simply hibernating there but were uh, more down in the valleys during the summer when they were eating. And they became extinct around 20,000, 24,000 years ago during the last glacial maximum. So this is a reconstruction of what um, Europe might have looked like. This is a reconstruction of the Cresswell Crags during a cold period of the Ice Age. And it's, it's quite dark and snowy, and there's just little bits of grass and moss sticking out. There's not a whole lot to eat. Here we see another reconstruction um, of what Northern Spain might have looked like during the Pleistocene. We see some other animals as well. We have some woolly mammoths here. Um, we have some cave lions that are eating a reindeer. We have horses here and a woolly rhino over here. And they are all animals that the cave bears shared their environment with. So let's have a look at those first before we get to the cave bears themselves. Um, we have horses in Europe during the Pleistocene. Um, the lineage of true horses actually emerged in Europe at the beginning of the middle Pleistocene, so a little bit before um, the cave bears were there and we were still looking at its ancestor, the Denninger's bear. And um, throughout the upper Pleistocene, so throughout the time that cave bears were there, horses underwent um, a size decrease um, and they started getting slowly smaller, possibly because temperatures were decreasing. We also see a Pleistocene wolf here. It was comparable in size to a large modern gray wolf, but it had some 
adaptations to its skull. So for example, the palate was different, the teeth were slightly different, and um, that would have allowed it to um, scavenge and hunt much larger prey because in the Pleistocene, we had mammoths and those kinds of things running around that European wolves no longer have right now. And then we have a Spiga here in the back, um, which doesn't really, its morphology doesn't really seem to have changed much since prehistoric times. We also have the Step Bison. Um, it was over two meters tall at the withers and it was about 900 kilos in weight. The tips of the horns were a meter apart and the horns themselves were over half a meter long. So this was an immense animal. Then we have the hour ox, which looks quite similar. Um, and that probably evolved in Asia and then migrated west and north during the warm interglacial periods. You might remember um, the graph with the little um, yellow parts. The yellow parts are the warmer periods. That's when these hour ox were probably migrating. Then we have the Irish elk, which was also living around the same time. It was also very large. Um, it's not for naught that it was called giant deer as well. It stood about um, two meters and 10 centimeters tall at the, at the shoulders. And it carried the largest known antlers of any deer that we're aware of as paleontologists. Um, the antlers were a maximum of um, three meters and 65 centimeters from tip to tip, and they weighed about 40 kilograms each. Um, there's a certain locality where they found over a hundred of these Irish elk and they were all um, males. And so that indicates that the bucks and the does were segregated at least during winter and spring. And it's actually quite, quite common behavior modern deer do it as well. It's because males and females have different nutritional requirements and they need to consume different types of plants. So they split up in different groups. And it's very interesting that simply from um, one paleontological find like that, you can infer this type of behavior which wouldn't normally fossilize. We also had cave links around that time. Um, body mass reconstructions indicate that it weighed about 23 kilos, so it was quite a large cat. Um, the paleoecology of the cave links is unknown, but its morphological features suggest that its behavior was probably very similar to modern lynx, simply because it, it looks the same, so we assume it behaved the same. We also had reindeer. Um, and especially during the late Pleistocene, reindeer occurred much further south than they do now, and they were even found in Spain. Here we have a cave lion. Um, we have little cute cub over here, and here we have an adult male. And you might notice that um, this lion doesn't have any mane. Uh, how do we know that this lion doesn't have any mane? Well, we have cave drawings. And this is a cave drawing from a Chauvet cave and it depicts two lions walking next to each other. We have a slightly smaller individual here in the foreground and a larger individual in the background. And um, we can clearly recognize the scrotum here. So we know that this larger one is male but it doesn't have any manes. And that's how we know that Ice Age lions didn't have any manes. Uh, there was also woolly uh, rhinos walking around and um, it was covered with long and thick hair that allowed it to survive in the extreme cold. Um, we see that in other animals as well, in the mammoth and the cave bear itself. It had a very large hump here over the shoulders. Um, and it was mainly feeding on herbaceous plants that grew in the mammoth steppe. There were also cave hyenas, which preyed on uh, large mammals or scavenged on large mammals. 
uh, mostly wild horses, step bison, and woolly rhinoceroses. We know this because um, they are responsible for the accumulation of hundreds of large Pleistocene mammal bones um, in caves, but also in sinkholes, mud pits, and areas along the rivers. And we know that they are responsible because we can tell by the tooth marks which animal preyed on these animals. We can distinguish whether it was a cave lion or a cave hyena. And in most cases, it is cave hyenas that drag their bones into their dens and then gnawed on them. I already mentioned the woolly mammoth as well. Um, it's actually among the best studied of any prehistoric animal. And that's because uh, we've discovered many frozen carcasses in Siberia and Alaska, uh, but we also have skeletons, we have teeth, we have stomach content, we have dung, um, we have cave paintings that depict them um, in their life positions. Um, and so we know that the woolly mammoth was roughly the same size as a modern African elephant and a newborn calf would have weighed around 90 kilograms. It was covered in fur and it had an outer covering of long guard hairs and then a shorter undercoat to really insulate it properly. The color of the coat uh, seems to have varied from quite dark to quite light. We know that from the permafrost carcasses that we found. And the ears and the tail were very short. You can, you can see, well, you can see, Ears because they are so short, they kind of disappear in the fur and that minimizes frostbite and heat loss. There were also musk um, oxes and they appeared around 1 million years ago and they were common just south of the Scandinavian ice sheet. So they were very close to the ice uh, where there was tundra during the cold periods but they are also rarely found um, in more benign and wooded areas uh, such as France or uh, Spain. And there they coexisted with red deer and our ox, for example. So how did the cave bear then behave in this environment? Well, we know that cave bear bones are more abundant in the deep parts of the cave and the areas closer to the entrance are more exposed to climatic variations and predators. So we expect, that, we suspect that they were going deeper into the caves to avoid these temperature variations and to avoid predators. Um, while walking into the cave, they rubbed um, against the walls of the cave. And here we see a patch that's been polished by the bears rubbing past the walls. And they were doing this because obviously um, they didn't have flashlights or anything like that. And the only way to find their way in the cave is to simply follow the wall, just keep touching the wall and then you know where you're going. And you can really find these polished tracks where they've been walking. Um, and there's hibernation. Um, for a long time, people thought that bears didn't truly hibernate because their temperature doesn't drop as far as, for example, in small mammals. But um, we've recently adapted the definition of hibernation. So now it includes what bears do as well. Um, the cave bears would create um, kind of a hollow uh, that you see here on the left. And they would sleep in this hollow. And we also see the footprints here. Those are actual cave bear footprints. Um, such a, a hollow or wallow um, would have a diameter of about 50 centimeters and they are always grouped together. So they were kind of creating bear dormitories where multiple bears were all sleeping together. And we know from genetic analyses that the bears um, sleeping in the same cave or at least dying in the same cave uh, were all closely related to each other. So animals kept going back to the same cave. So the cave they were born in is likely the cave that they were also hibernating in, um, except for the fact that males tend to hibernate in different caves from females, but even they are very loyal to their own cave. 
so um yeah i already mentioned that they they always keep going back to the same caves and we can tell that um you know this is little cub um but you know that they are related to the other animals in the caves um interesting also is that um the bears have their babies during hibernation. So they have an embryonic diapause, and that means that there is a delayed implantation of the fetus or of the embryo in the uterus so that it is born during hibernation rather than just before or just after. Um, bear gestation is also very, very short, and um, the cubs are born with a very small size in the middle of winter when the female is still asleep. Um, and we find a lot of these perinatal bones, so animals that were either just born or were about to be born. In fact, um, they represent up to 70% of the total population in caves. So um, I suppose not all births went very well. Um, the cave bears also scratched the walls of the cave. You can, you can see it here and there's a close up here. All these scratches, uh, thousands of them have been recorded in caves. And um, the largest number of these scratches are in the deepest chambers where we also find most of the bones. And they are often associated with the areas where these sleep hollows were located. And Usually you see that the, the scratches are in the form of three or five parallel grooves. I'm not sure you can see that on the photographs, but it's either three or five parallel grooves. And um, the ones that we see here in this photograph, they're actually quite low. So we suspect that this particular, this particular case, it was a young animal that was perhaps trying to play or trying to imitate the older bears. Um, but for the adults, we think that they were probably doing this to kind of indicate their um, indicate their their territory. We also find cave bears in cave art, but they are relatively poorly represented, and we only have around sixty cave drawings of cave bears. Um, here we see a cave bear from Chauvet Cave, and you can very clearly see this stepped forehead, which I showed you before in the skull. And to the right, we see a possible brown bear where we don't see the stepped forehead. So it's actually relatively easy to distinguish between the two bear species, even in simple drawings like this. Um, so let's kind of get to the, the core of my talk, which is supposed to be the diet of cave bears. So we have all these bear relatives, the polar bear, the panda bear, uh, the black bears, um, and they all have different diets. So plants for the panda, mostly seals and fish for the polar bear. And then we have a bunch of omnivores here in the middle. And then the question of course becomes, what did the cave bear eat? Uh, was it a ferocious predator that might have even killed humans? Um, or was it a friendly large giant that was feeding on grasses and lichens and mosses? Well, before we can answer that question, we need to have a look at what accident bears eat. So here we see an American black bear trying to get to the food storage of some poor campers who have to put their food all the way up in the trees. Um, well, not even up in the trees because they can climb trees, but hanging in the air, mid air between the trees so the bears can't get to it because they are omnivores and they pretty much eat the same stuff that we eat. Then we have the panda, which eats exclusively plant matter. And on the other end of the spectrum, we have the polar bear, which eats exclusively meat and blubber. And um, then there's also bears that are specialized um, on insects. Here we see the Malayan sun bear. It has an extremely long tongue to lick up termites and ants. 
And it, it feeds on other things too, like fruits, but it, it has some special adaptations for insects. So how do we then determine what the cave bear might have eaten? Well, there is this thing that we call functional morphology. And that means that the animal is adapted to its behavior. And you can see that here in the skull, that the attachment sites of the muscles and the direction in which the muscle pulls, um, we, can, we can determine that from what the skull and the mandible looks like. And then we can use that to infer their diet. And as you can see here, different species of bear have very different shaped skulls. So we have the Malayan sun bear here with a very small rounded skull. Um, and if you compare that to the polar bear, which has a very robust elongated skull, that's because they are adapted to different diets. And we're gonna try and use this to our advantage to figure out what the cave bear was eating. So to do this, I used this apparatus, which is a microscribe, and you can take 3D landmarks on the skull or the mandible. And landmarks are points that are very clearly defined so you can repeat them on every new skull that you get your hands on. Um, and then you get the X, Y, and Z coordinates of all these points. And what you do with that next is quite complicated. So I'll try and explain it with a two-dimensional example. This is a shoulder blade of gorillas. And if we take these three, these or these five landmarks, they all have X and Y coordinates. And we see the raw data here, which is quite messy. And what we do is we translate all these landmark configurations so that they are all centered. And then it looks a lot better already. And then we scale the specimens so that they are all the same size. And then it looks even better. And then we rotate them so that the landmarks are as comparable as possible. And that's what we see in this image. And when we're in this image or in this, this stage, these landmarks, these X and Y coordinates can be used as normal variables in your normal statistical analyses. Um, and so that's what I've done. Um, first, I'll, I'll walk you through um, what I've done with the mandible. So I've done a partially squares analysis and the statistical details of that aren't important, um, but it, it directly links diet to um, morphology. And what we see is uh, the phylogenetic tree that we've seen before, the family tree of bears. Um, and we see that the polar bear, uh, sorry, the panda bear is over here and it ate moly, mostly foliage. That's uh, leaves and, and green parts of plants. And then we have the Malayan sun bear and the sloth bear over here. And they eat mostly vertebrates invertebrates. Um, we have the polar bear over here. It eats mostly vertebrates. And then here in the middle, we have all the omnivores. And you can really see that these animals evolved in the direction that the arrow of their particular food item is going. So what about the cave bear? What was the cave bear eating? Well, when we look at this line, we see that it's evolved in exactly the same direction as an increase of foliage in the diet and in exactly the same direction as the panda bear, which eats 100% only plants, uh, exactly the same direction as he evolved. Now, it morphologically still looks very similar to the brown bear, but that's because they are very closely related. So it had a different starting point when it started evolving, but it still evolved in the same direction as the panda, indicating that it was increasing the amount of plant matter in its diet through evolution. And you can um, tell that by the shape of the lower jaw. So if we have 
the um, polar bear here, we see that the masseter muscle and the temporal muscle, they pull in very different directions. The brown bear is an omnivore and they come a little bit closer. And the cave bear, which we based on these results suspect might have been a herbivore, um, they pull very much in the same direction, which makes it easier to grind plant matter between your jaws. Now, let's say we wanted to find out how much plant matter this cave bear was actually eating. So I did a regression analysis. Um, and we have the, the principal component scores here. I've not shown the principal component analysis, but it, it's very similar to the partial lead squares analysis. So we have the principal component scores here, and we have the amount of foliage here. And then you can do quite a nice regression between all the different species. So we have the polar bear and the sloth bear and the Malayan sun bear over here, which don't have any foliage in their diet. And we have the panda all the way up here, which has a lot of foliage in the diet. And then the omnivores in the middle. Um, and the cave bear is actually this line over here. So very close to the um, panda. And I've calculated that it must have had almost 80% of foliage in its diet. And if we do a phylogenetically corrected regression analysis, so if we take into account that it might have plotted a little bit lower because it's closely related to the brown bears, we take that into account, then it's even 69% foliage. So almost completely foliage. Um, I've also looked at the direct ancestor of the cave bears, the Denninger's bear. And I've had to use um, slightly different landmarks because this part is very often broken off and this part is very often broken off because the fossils are simply a lot older and not as many fossils have been preserved. Um, but we see a very similar picture. Um, we see the panda over here on the one end and then on the other end, we see the Malayan sun bear, the sloth bear, and the polar bear, which are um, eating animals, whether it's insect or meat, they are eating more animals. The omnivores in the middle, and we see that the cave bear plots very close to the panda. And the Denninger's bear here, the little blue dots, they are very, very close to cave bears, but you can, it's actually very interesting because you can see that they are a intermediate form between the omnivorous um, ancestor of brown bears and becoming more herbivorous over time in this direction. Now, I've not only looked at the mandible, I've also looked at the skull. And for the cave bear, I've only looked at its closest relatives. So the two black bears, and the brown bear. So the American black bear, the Asiatic black bear, and the brown bear. Um, and I'll, I'll explain later why I've restricted myself. Um, and again, we see that there's uh, an increase in principal component one values uh, of these bears. And when we look at the amount of foliage and the amount of roots, we see that the amount of foliage here in blue increases across the first principal component. And so we can calculate what that means for the cave bear. And it actually means that it has a range of um, between 21 and 61% um, foliage in its diet. And it probably also had roots in its diet. You can't calculate that because both of these have zero. You, you can't have less than zero. So there's not a nice regression line to calculate this. Um, now that's a lot less than I've calculated before. So um, what could be the cause? Well, that becomes a little bit clearer when we look at um, my analysis that I did for the Denninger spare. And what we see here is a very similar um, very similar situation to what we saw before with the two black bears, the brown bear and the cave bear. It's 
mirror image, but it's essentially the same relationships. But we also see the panda here and the spectacle bear here. And what this tells me is that when I'm looking at this graph, I'm actually not looking so much at diet, but I am mostly looking at phylogeny where the panda split off first, the spectacled bear split up, then we have a bunch of bears that kind of split off sequentially, but very close to each other. And then we have the brown bear, which is closely related to the cave bear and Denninger's bear. So I'm, I'm not actually looking so much at diet here. And that's because the skull is not only for chewing your food, it's also for protecting your brain, it's for smelling, it's for seeing, it's for hearing. So it has a lot of different functions and you can't just change the morphology to adapt to diet if that means that you can no longer see well. Whereas for the mandible, that's really specific only for food. And so the animal is very well adapted in that respect. And so I trust my results of the mandible much more than I trust my results of the skull because there's just so many other factors getting involved there. Now that's my research. And it would be nice if we can kind of corroborate that with other people's research. And we can look at tooth morphology, for example. Uh, here we see a tooth row of a cave bear. And let's compare that to other bears. So um, here we see a Malayan sun bear and it's not so very similar. The molars are very smooth and the premolars are very thick and bulbous almost. So let's compare it to the polar bear. That's also certainly not it. It's um, much too narrow the tooth row. Uh, especially here, it's very sharp for cutting meat. So that's not what's going on with the cave bear. Then we look at the brown bear. Now we're starting to get somewhere, right? Especially this area is starting to look close, but the premolar is still very underdeveloped. Whereas here we have a very developed premolar with extra cusps, really um, suitable for eating plants. We see the same thing here in the panda. It also has all these extra cusps around the premolars, um, and we call that molarization. So the premolars are taking up the role of the molars to really chew the, um, the plant material. We can also look at tooth root morphology. Um, we've looked at the um, dimensions of um, tooth root area compared to skull size. And for the brown bear, the black bear, and the polar bear, we see that they have very similar um, patterns. And we see that the panda has a very different pattern because it has a very different diet. And the cave bear is actually kind of a combination of the two. We see that here um, around the canine and the first premolars, it's um, really quite similar to its closest living relatives, but then towards the back where the chewing of the plant matter takes place, that's where it becomes more similar to the panda. Now we can go a little bit smaller than that. We can look at tooth wear. Um, and um, here we see an example. This is not a bare tooth, but you can see all these um, scratches and you can also have pits and the amounts of pits and scratches and which directions they are tells you something about the diet. So here we see a comparison of the cave bear with uh, the brown bear and black bear. And what we see is that the cave bear looks very different. It has all these scratches that are running parallel Whereas in the brown and the black bear, the scratches are running crisscross and we see a lot of pits as well, uh, which are usually caused by eating fruit. So they were having an omnivorous diet and this bear was definitely not doing the same thing. It was definitely doing something else. But it's difficult to say what it was doing because we don't really have a proper comparison with the panda. Um, 
This is um, the scratches that you see in a panda, which is also very, very uh, parallel to each other. So very similar to what we see here, but unless you take the exact same patch on the exact same tooth, you cannot compare the results directly. So this is an indication for me that it looks similar, but it could also be because this is a different tooth than this tooth. So you have to be careful when interpreting that. We can go even smaller. Um, in fact, you are what you eat. So we can go to the molecular level uh, where the nitrogen and the carbon that you take up through your food become part of your body, but not one-to-one. -one. There's always a bias towards um, lighter isotopes and you tend to build in the lighter isotopes. Or the heavier ones, to be honest, I'm confused. Uh, anyway, there's a bias. Um, and so what we see here um, is bears, the cave bear here. And we see some herbivores over here. And we see that the herbivores have a different isotopic value for carbon um, than than, than the cave bear does. So there's a difference in carbon values. And so based on this, you might think that they couldn't possibly be herbivores because then they would have plotted over here. Um, well, that may seem like that at first sight, but there have been subsequent analyses with many more species, for example, this by Pocheron and what we see is indeed when you compare the cave bears to just a few herbivores, you might think that they have different carbon values, but when you compare it to the, the complete range of herbivores, we see actually that the, um, the values are very similar to, for example, horses who are definitely herbivores. So no need. To, to think that they weren't. Um, but then there's a little, little problem. We have these two over here and teams from uh, Romania have posited that these values, these nitrogen values are very similar to carnivores, which we see here in red. And that's true, they are very similar to carnivores. So if you compare the cave bears just to other carnivores, you would indeed say, oh, it's similar to carnivores. And it's the N values are similar to carnivores and the C values are not similar to herbivores, therefore it must be a carnivore. But again, in the grand scheme of things, they're actually very, very similar to mammoths. Now, why these two are different from all these other ones? Um, that question remains to be answered, but it's possible that it has to do with hibernation. And if you hibernate for longer, um, that affects how your body deals with, um, like it, it uh, for example, it reabsorbs urea um, and um, it reuses a lot of the elements and then it starts using different isotopes. And so that hibernation might change this. And it could be that in, in Romania, there was simply a different climate than in the Western parts of Europe. And they were hibernating for longer and that caused this isotopic difference. Um, right, okay, I've already kind of explained that. Um, so when you look at the grand scheme of things, everything from the skull morphology to the tooth morphology, to the scratches on the teeth, to even to the molecules, it all points to the cave bear being a very gentle grass eating giant. So do cave bears have nothing to do with eating meat then? Well, not quite. We have found a lot of cave bear bones with cut marks in different areas, here and here and here. Um, and so we know that humans were actually eating cave bears instead of the other way around. And it's quite likely that they were um, hunting these bears during hibernation when they're not running away and you can relatively easily hunt them and then 
Um, also, them being a very good food source during winter when there's not a lot of other food around. Um, and so they were either hunting or perhaps scavenging, but probably hunting the cave bears. So it was the world upside down, really. So thank you very much for your attention, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thanks very much for that. Um, I'm. Uh... <laughs> familiar with your your work for a few years but it's just so cool in all the different aspects it was really really interesting i'll reiterate again um that uh if um uh, anybody wants to send we've got some questions coming in so i keep sending them in we're going to uh deal with start dealing with them shortly and uh, i'll do firstly sort of mention that um next week's uh speaker um, sponsored by the Toronto Museum Cooperating Society, will be Dr. Elena Cuesta Fidalgo. Um, and we're staying in Munich, uh, but she's just down the road at the Paleontology Museum. Um, and she'll be talking about dinosaurs of Spain, the real dragons of Don Quixote. And I'll give you a little bit more of a preview of that at the end of the question session. But now to get back to the uh, questions for uh, yourself, Annika, we've had a, a few that have um, uh, uh, come in. One was, did, is there any uh, scat evidence uh, um, in terms of um, uh, supporting material that uh, um, says either way in terms of the dietary preferences of these animals? Sorry, any what evidence? Scat, like dung. Ah, okay, sorry, I, I didn't understand that word. Uh, so for cave bears, I'm not aware of any fossilized um, scats, no. Um, so we do find a lot of scats, but it's mostly from cave hyenas because they eat a lot of bones. Um, their scats is, are very calcified and they preserve very well. Um, but I'm, I'm not aware of, of cave bear's cat, which doesn't mean it doesn't exist, but I'm not aware of it. Okay, on, on a similar uh, uh, question, um, uh, Tracy asks, uh, regarding the footprints that you showed, um, uh, how uh, do you know they're cave bears and um, how are they not degraded from erosion over time? How are they uh, preserved, those particular footprints? Um, well, we, we know they're cave bears because they are found close to these hollows um, and they look like bear prints. So, you know, they weren't made by a cow or something like that. We can tell it's some sort of bear and because they're close to the hollows, we can infer that they're from the cave bears. How they're preserved. Um, I mean, of course, not all the footprints are preserved. This is quite, quite special. Um, but caves are very, very sheltered. So if there's not any any rivers running through it if there's not any water if there's not any wind then what's going to happen to the footprint nothing it's just going to stay there yeah fair point <laughs> um one question that occurred to me during your presentation was um, um quite often you can get a, a disparity in terms of dietary niche transition on the basis of um change in body size uh, was there any sign of that uh, at all within your data or is it in, in entirely separate um, from the, the causes you were outlining? Well, the Denninger bear is slightly smaller than the cave bear, so it, it could have gone together. Um, I mean, that's something that I could, you could probably look at with modern brown bears because they're all the same species, but they come in very different sizes. Um, yeah. But it, it really, it would no, it wouldn't make sense though, because when you look at modern brown bears, it's the large ones, so the grizzly bears that eat relatively much meat and fish and salmon, um, and it's the small ones, the European brown bears that eat mostly plants. And in yeah. cave bears, it would have been the other way around. As they became larger, they started eating more plants. So within bears, um, there doesn't seem to be a, a pattern. Okay. That's cool. Um, uh, Jacqueline Moreno says, a great presentation, um, and asks, what was the source of uh, fat for the cave bear? I don't think that they were eating much fat. I suspect that they mostly got it from, from sugars. Uh, you probably mean how they were fattening up before their hibernation, right? So that's probably mostly from sugars, from berries and, and fruits and 
stuff like that, and also carbohydrates from tubers. So they were eating roots and tubers, but they weren't eating fat directly, not like the fatty salmon that the grizzly bears eat, no. Okay, that's cool. Um, Sandra Sarwan uh, asks, does do dental calculi or tartar get preserved in specimens of this age? Um, uh, asking from the perspective of uh, using microbial and chemical data from the residues um, to cement the herbivoreal niche that um, the cave bear would probably occupy. Is, is that uh, something that gets preserved, the, the tartar covering on the teeth? I suppose it could be, but I don't know anybody who's studied that on cave bears, but I suppose it would be. I know that in humans, they can go back quite far and they can do it with Neanderthals, which lived around the same time period. So um, if bears have that, uh, which I'm not, I'm not, I, to be honest, I'm not sure all animals have that because I suppose it depends on diet, right? We as humans yeah. have quite a starchy, sugary diet. And I, so I'm not sure. If, if bears would have that, but if they do, then it should be preserved because it's preserved in Neanderthals, but I don't know anybody who works on it, so. Okay, no, that is, it, it is. might be a, a niche to go into if you're interested in that. Yeah, <laughs> there's your a next research question. funding. Very good question. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Sandor also was, was asking, um, is it possible that the ancestral bear stock originated in Eurasia presence of Ursus Minimus and then move to the Americas via the Bering Straits. I mean, uh, is that a possibility? I think arguing for American bears forming a clade of organization or something like that. Yeah, I think, I think that's very well possible. I don't think that we've quite worked it out yet because those very old fossils, there's not many fossils remaining. And, you know, you only need to find one fossil on a different continent that's slightly older to change all the ideas that you have. So yeah. Really, anything is possible. I was going to ask, uh, there seemed to be um, a lot of the reconstructions that you used were from museum dioramas. Uh, and I was interested, which uh, museum uh, were the bulk of them sourced to? Because there seemed to be a stylistic sort of continuity for a lot of them. Uh, yeah, so this is the Rice Engelhorn Museums in Mannheim. I was there last year for the International Cave Bear Symposium. Um, and they... Um, yeah, they had this exhibition and I, I basically photographed everything. <laughs> <laughs> and it came in handy because, you yeah. know, then it's my own photo so I can use it without issue. <laughs> That's excellent. Um, uh, in terms of, uh, speaking of uh, sort of uh, illustrative representations, um, Sender asks about cave drawings in terms of human observations. Um, in, and asks about observation bias within them and, and how to account for that in, in reconstructions. But I, uh, I'm not sure, did you say that there was only half a dozen images of cave bears that have been re recorded? No, no, 60, 60. 60, my apologies, yeah. right. Um, so that would be, uh, I suppose, enough to do um, uh, some sort of analysis for consistency. Um, I, I must admit, when I, I was watching, I, I saw your distinction of the, the stepped um, uh, front and the skull, and thinking, yeah. well, maybe maybe that community over there, they they had Reg, who isn't a particularly good drawer, and uh, he he just misses out on those little details. But uh, but yeah, the presence of the step and the reconstruction seems to be a, a really good um, uh, diagnostic factor. Um, yeah. So in in general, these cave drawings are very accurate. Like you you saw on the cave lion, they even draw the little bulbous thing for the scrotum. Like they are yeah. very precise. Um, so I I do not doubt at all that these cave drawings of cave bears are accurate. Okay, that's cool. Um, Gary asks. Um, in terms of the size and position of the eyes. Do they differ within the the, the group um, according to the habits at all, or or the nasal cavity? Does that vary at all um, uh, based on the habits? Is there some sort of consistency of pattern uh, according to the animal and according to the, the the given bear's behavior? Well, so probably not so much the habits, but more the habitat. So, uh, for example, the polar bear has quite a large nasal cavity um, because when it breathes in the cold air, it needs to be warmed up properly before it enters the lungs. 
Um, so you you do see differences. Uh, you do see differences there. Yes, definitely. Sarah asks, um, where did grizzly bears evolve from? Was it more the, uh, I don't think it's the cave bear line, but is, is, it, um, is it near to the cave bear line or is it an entirely different um, strand? Yeah, so uh, brown bears, um, <laughs> polar bears and cave bears, they all share one common ancestor. And so the grizzly bears are just, just a subspecies of brown bears, basically. So you have um, last common ancestor, then the cave bear split off, um, then it continues a little bit further, and then it splits off into polar bears and brown bears. And then the brown bears split off into all these different subspecies, like the grizzly bear and the marsican bear in Europe. And there's, I think, seven different subspecies of brown bear. Okay. Um, Ravan, Sarah, and uh, Gary, both uh, thank you for an excellent uh, presentation. Uh, Ravan, Sarah says, learned a lot from that. Um, it's always good. Thank That's you. what we're here for. <laughs> um, so, uh, I, is there, if there's any last questions to come in, Robin, uh, again, is uh, saying um, thank you for the informative, well-organized presentation. Learned a lot. Um, if you want, if anybody has any last questions, then they should uh, produce them quickly. Um, otherwise, we shall start to wind this up. Um, I'll do a quick preview for uh, Elena, who will be speaking next week uh, on the dinosaurs of Spain, the real dragons of Don Quixote. Don Quixote confused everyday objects with threats from a world of legend. One of his many adventures took place in the front of a dragon it was actually a wagon with two torches. However, Don Quixote was not running ahead of reality. In, Spain's, in Spain, particularly in La Mancha, actual dragons, in inverted commas, were living more than 66 million years ago, the dinosaurs. Dinosaur fossils in Spain have been found in several fossil sites around the Iberian Peninsula. Las Hoyas, La Hueca, and Morea among others, have a global scientific impact due to their exceptional preservation and the huge numbers of fossils that have been collected. Some of these dinosaurs, such as Concavenator, have unusual features that have allowed us to decipher the evolutionary history of the dinosaur lineage. There is no doubt that if Don Quixote had walked through the Cretaceous wetlands of Castilla-La Mancha, he would have been surprised by more than one dragon, providing him the opportunity to live one of his greatest poetic adventures. Um, and say again that uh, uh, Dr. Elena Cuesta, um, she is that uh, rarest of uh, positions that uh, she actually has had uh, her thesis animal, which is complete, quite new, appear in the last Jurassic World film. So there you go. That's that's topical for you. Um, I believe we have a couple more questions, uh, Annika. Um, the is there any particular reason for the, the supposed flattened skull in cave bears and the steepened forehead? Um, yes. Uh, so uh, similar to um, the polar bear, which has this large nasal, nasal cavity because it had to warm up the air, um, the cave bear skull is full of sinuses. So these empty spaces in your, in your skull that, um, that hurt when you have cold. Um, and that's also insulation to protect the brain from the cold. Um, and that caused kind of the, 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 the forehead to be, to, to go up so straight, right? So the snout is really quite, let's say normal for a bear, but then the skull goes up to have space for all these sinuses to insulate the rest of the skull. Okay, nice and concise. <laughs> um... I think with that, we'll draw things to a close. Um, and once again, I'd like to thank Dr. Van Heteren for her presentation. Uh, excellent and extremely clear. And uh, we're hoping that you'll, um, all you audience out there will join us uh, next week for the next pres uh, presenter in the Terrell Museum speaker series as sponsored by the Terrell Museum Cooperating Society. Thanks again, Annika. Yes. Thank you very much for having me. I enjoyed it. Thank you.